I know most people don't think about us up there in the mountains. Many of my patients are minors. It's dangerous work, and they carry the burden of building this nation on their backs. They're a pain. These people, my people, trusted me. I can't believe how many of them are dead now. The show is very much the indictment and the trial of Purdue Pharma that never ultimately happened. Um, and so what the show does is it lays out the case that the assistant U.S. attorneys built and the evidence that they compiled that shows the crimes of Purdue that they did plead guilty to. <laughs> you know, people often don't remember that they pled guilty to a uh, criminal misbranding in a statement of facts. And those statement of facts that they pled guilty to are incredibly damning. It is unbelievably damning what they have already pled guilty to, although Post that, they try to minimize it, they downplay it, they pretend it, didn't, it never even happened. This is a criminal company run by a single family that micromanaged that company who lied for years about their own involvement with the company. They, they would constantly claim, oh, that they were, they were passively involved. You know, that's all this company does is they lie over and over and over again. Um, and for us, it was, it was, you know, before Beth came on board, it was my mission to expose it. And then all of a sudden I've got this warrior with me who's an expert and it's like, we're like, we're going to, we're going to show, we're going to show the country what this criminal company uh, did to it. The power of the show is you see it all playing out in real time. You see these dastardly lies being created in a boardroom and then you see it playing out inside a doctor's office and on the streets and in a way that I try to describe in my book, but when you actually see it um, in, in, uh, in a television series, it's really, really powerful. And um, we've talked about how the show jumps back and forward in time, but um, Americans with our attention spans and, and probably all human beings, we're not that good at um, taking uh, a real grasp of a long story. This story begins in 1996 and is still happening today. In fact, it's worse than ever. Our show mostly ends around 07 with the end of the first case. But um, what Danny has done is he's put all the pieces together in this very entertaining vehicle that teaches us how it happened and what we need to do going forward. And uh, it's just very powerful. We've looking at something that could be big. OxyContin. Purdue Pharma, they've been marketing the drug as something that's not addictive, when it clearly is. All your doctors are going to be asking, how is this even possible? Your most effective talking point are these magic words. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. They told me that less than 1% would become addicted. I first wrote about the heroin epidemic. My first book, Factory Man, was about the aftermath of globalization. And when I was finishing that book, I was noticing that in these tiny little towns, much like Finch Creek, um, in places where the jobs were going away and where there were lots of workplace injuries, you know, the, the, the farmer reps had targeted those areas um, for painkillers. And these places were starting to have not just pill problems, but also people were switching to heroin when they got cut off the pills. And you started seeing a crime on a level that you had never seen before. And so I circled back to my agent and my editor back in 15 and decided to turn my original newspaper reporting and some of the earlier work I had done for Factory Man into dope sick. Beth captured um, what it was like for people on the ground, you know, people that had become um, addicted to the drug uh, and telling their stories in such a such a, a vivid and powerful way that it was I, I thought it was very special. It was a, it was actually a weird situation where I'd, I'd actually sold this show to 20th, my studio, before I knew about Beth's book uh, that it existed. And then they simultaneously another studio at the same company bought Beth's book, not knowing I had sold the show. So I had this project and they asked me if I would team up with them because they just bought this book. And uh, so I read the book 
And it was, you know, everything I just said, it was just so, so powerful. And then more importantly, I met Beth. (laughs) <laughs> and she was an incredible person. And I thought she would be a wonderful asset to to this show that I was developing. So that was sort of how this unusual uh, marriage came to be. Foxy Cotton does what I think it can. It could soon become Purdue's first billion dollar drug. There, there's there's a lot of people that have covered the subject. And like I said, Beth did it in a way uh, that was that had its own unique spin, which I think uh, helps give Dope Sick, um, uh, you know, a lot of um, the heart that it has, um, you know, these stories, the, the personal stories, and they are composite characters uh, of, of the town Finch Creek. Uh, I, I think it it gives the show an emotion, an emotional core and a heart to it uh, by seeing the people that are suffering from the decisions that are being made um, in Purdue Pharma. And then we're able to dramatize those as well. So going back and forth between Purdue Pharma making these uh, incredibly dishonest, uh, villainous decisions on how to market their drug and then intercutting it with the victims which was sort of a central concept of of how I saw the show in the first place, combined with the investigators that are trying to bring a case against Purdue Pharma or trying to stop Purdue Pharma. Um, The combination of all that uh, was was what I hope to be very powerful. Um, And at times, to be honest with you, quite exciting, a bit of a thriller seeing these investigators and these assistant U.S. attorneys bring a case against them, Um, but then also never forgetting the victims and what they're going through. And, and so, you know, that was the original concept of the show was all these intertwining stories in different time periods because the investigation took place in a different time period. The DEA investigation took place in a different time period. So it was, it was very ambitious from, from the get-go. Um, and, uh, and, and this is where we ended up. Yeah, so I was in the writer's room, like every time we got together, um, once the show started shooting, I mean, first of all, we were all together in LA and then COVID happened. So we were only together for like 10 days. And then we all, you know, scattered to our homes. I'm in Virginia. The rest of them are in LA. Um, but luckily we already knew each other and had developed some trust. And so when we're brainstorming how to break the stories and, and the different episodes, um, I think we had a good head start because we knew each other and trusted each other. I was a little slow on um, because of being such a, you know, a journalist, a newspaper journalist, a book author. Um, it, it took me a while to, to capture how different writing for television was. And, you know, just the fact that like suddenly you don't have this major tool of explaining history and expository writing and analysis. You have to show it all. And, um, you know, I've told many of my friends, it was like, you know, working with Danny and the other writers in the room. I mean, we had two of them were just total pros. We had a person in recovery um, who had spent time in a methadone clinic. We had um, two people who are from rural America. We brought in a bunch of consultants to sort of fill in the gaps. And, and then just getting to work with Danny, who was just like exudes story propulsive storytelling, um, emotional wallop, humor even, um, was like getting a master class, was like taking a master class. Purdue continues to lie about the drug safety to doctors, to patients, and the FDA. We have a major case here. You know, on casting, I cast every character, uh, and I was on set for every moment of, of the show. Um, and the actors were incredible. And, you know, I directed the last two of them as well. So it was, you know, it was really labor intensive and, and uh, but a really exciting project. And the cast wise, you know, I ended up with, I think, just some of the most talented actors working in the business. You know, Michael Keaton and Peter Sarsgaard and Michael Stuhlbarg uh, and Rosario Dawson is amazing in the show. And then Caitlin Deaver. Um, you know, we all called her little Meryl Streep on set because she just she blew our minds. You know, every this 24 year old shows up, has one of the most complicated roles and nails every take just out of the gate effortlessly. I mean, we were just in awe of her. 
Um, so, you know, the production, we were blessed with just an incredibly talented group of people. And, you know, the pilot was directed by Barry Levinson, who is a personal hero of mine, one of the greats, you know, and also having Michael Keaton in the show, another childhood hero. So I had these like two heroes that I'm working with. Um, and, and that in and of itself is going to elevate any project you, um, you know, that you're working on to hopefully as high a level as you could possibly achieve when you've got people that are this talented and this iconic. Addiction rates, overdoses, and crime are on the rise across the country because of this drug. I think maybe the medicine might be just a tad more addictive than you said. I can't live like this anymore. It's going to be incredibly shocking when they actually see the lies that Purdue tell. I think they're, when you, it's one thing to read about it or to hear about it, but to watch it <laughs> is, it's, it's very disturbing uh, the extent that they lied about a highly addictive, dangerous narcotic, right? Uh, then I think that there will be certainly some anger at the victims of this uh, and sympathy for the anger. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I want the audience to take away from is exactly what, uh, Beth said, which is a path forward, a sense of what what can be done now. Like this has all happened. Uh, we, you know, we the, the 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 Sackler family has been exposed. Uh, the crimes of Purdue Pharma have been exposed. Uh, you know, the Sacklers had to testify before Congress and a congressman referred to them as one of the most evil families in the country. You know, this is this, these, these aren't phrases that you want associated with yourself. So this is everything's been exposed. So uh, and, and there's definitely a feeling that justice has not been brought um, to the Sackler family because of their actions, and it may never be brought, right? So what now? Okay, what now? How do we move forward? How do we turn the corner? Well, I think first and foremost, it's recovery. And it's about how can people that are sick get better? And the hope is that this show can can offer some solutions to that, some positive solutions that are actually not being utilized right now um, that could make a, a huge difference in so many people's lives. Uh, and so I think for me, that's, that's you know, I want people to walk away from this um, thinking, you know, A, having an understanding of what happened, what got us here, creating a public record, uh, you know, that's that's part of the culture so that the culture will understand what truly happened. And then simultaneously finding a path forward of how we can turn a corner and move on from this monstrosity that occurred on the American people. Our community is ground zero for a national catastrophe. Purdue will not move unless we punch hard. This is not our fault. These people want to be addicted. I want top executives to feel some pain. It's crucial they understand we've created the greatest painkiller in the history of human civilization. I think I can make this the biggest drug in the world.